Why do we Christians speak so confidently about God? Why do we make such statements about him as we do with boldness and conviction? It aggravates people who are not Christians sometimes. They say to themselves, sometimes they say to us, this God then, he must then be very great. This God you talk about. This God of everyone and everything, everywhere, for all time. He must be the God of everything, small and large. He must be the God of the night sky and all the amazing things that we see that we're still discovering about with telescopes and such things. He must then, this God of yours, they say to us, he must be the God of of everything that ever was, everything that we humans have ever built, great bridges and towers and pyramids and palaces. He must be the God of all these things. He must be the God of all music. This great God of yours, they they say, he must be the God of, of rock music and guitars and didgeridoos and organs and pianos and choirs and Beethoven, and Bach, and Brahms, and everything, every kind of music is under his rule, this great God. The God of artists and painters, Van Gogh, Rembrandt, the Mona Lisa. He is the God of all these things. The God of this dead and long-forgotten civilizations buried in the dust of time. The God of wars and conflicts, and emperors and rulers. He must then, this God of yours, they say, he must be the God of everyday life, of Twitter, of social media, of TV shows, of hospital visits, of family gatherings, of shopping malls and supermarkets. He must be the God then of success and failure, plenty and poverty, marriage and divorce, all the things of this world. He is the God of all of it, everything, all the complexity and the vastness of this world. Plants, trees, weeds, grass, vegetables, flowers, spring flowers, bees, all such things. Photosynthesis, nuclear fission, general relativity, modern physics, math, science, chemistry, all these wonders and complexities. He not only understands them all, he created and designed them all. What a great and vast God he must be. He is the God of microbes and galaxies, single-cell amoeba and supernova, the God of vast machines that human beings have invented to cause death and vast machines that save lives. What is he not the God of? Anything you can think of, he is God over it, over and above all, enthroned above everything that ever was, ever is, ever will be, ever could be. Why do we speak like we know and understand this very great God. Beyond what we can really take in, the God of everyone, everywhere, forever, why do we think we know really anything at all about him? Surely he must be beyond our small religion and our little gatherings. Surely he's far above anything we could know or understand. Why do you Christians talk so confidently about God, we may be asked? As if he's your God and not everyone else's God. As if you know about him and other people don't. Why do you tell us what he's like with such confidence? Why do you tell us what he wants for our lives? Why do you say he approves of this and disapproves of that? Why do you think you can say with such authority what kind of sex life he approves of? What kind of sex life he disapproves of? Why do you think everyone should worship him in the way you worship him? You find him in your church with your hymns and so on. I find him in nature. I go out for a walk on the hills or in the woods. That's my time with God. And in your church, why do you always do the same thing? Why don't you do something useful for once on a Sunday morning? Got a litter picking. Why are you so sure about this God then, this great God? Why do you think you know him well enough to decide what's right and what's wrong? Why do you tell us, they might say, why do you tell us about heaven and hell? As if you know exactly who's going there to each one. Why are you so sure that there are just those two destinations after death and nothing else? 
What gives you that conviction? What gives you the right to talk that way? And how dare you, they might say to us, how dare you say that we're all sinners in the sight of God? What gives you that right? To call me an evildoer? To say that God is offended at me? How dare you? They're shocked at us sometimes when they understand what we actually believe. Non-Christians are. They're shocked and offended. They find what we say distasteful and they wonder how we can be so bold as to say such things. How do you say, they might ask us, that this Jesus is the only way? Surely there are many ways. If God is that great and infinite being, surely there can't just be one little way, one narrow way is the only one. Surely that can't be right, they say. Surely there must be something in all these different ways of approaching God, all these different religions. They must have something going for them. I quite like the insights of this religion and that religion. And I saw this on the internet and I read that book and my friend told me about this. And these things make sense to me. But you insisting that Jesus is the only way. It must be through his death on the cross. That, they might say to us, is repulsive. This brings us to the the biggest question, the most fundamental question I think you could ever ask. One Jewish writer put it like this. Does God have a son? Does God have a son? This great God, this universal God, is he also in particular the man Jesus Christ? We talk about God in general. But can we specifically say, this man, Jesus Christ, is God? You see, that changes everything. If that's true, it changes everything. That's where we get this idea that God says this and God says that and we do this and we don't do that. And this is the way and no other. Because of him, because of Jesus Christ. John chapter 20, verse... 30 and 31, I read earlier. John tells us, verse 30 and 31 of John 20, why he wrote his book. Jesus, we're told, did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. And of course, John was himself one of those 12 disciples. He knows what he's talking about. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John wants us to understand that this Jesus then, in Jesus, is all the glory of God. All the divine glory is in this man. That he is, as he himself said he was, a ladder from heaven to earth, on which angels descend and ascend. He is, John wants us to understand and believe, the light, so that whoever follows him will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He is, and John wants us to know this and be sure and believe it, the way, the truth, the life. And the only possibility of coming to God is through him. John wrote his book then for this purpose so that we might understand that the fullness of God is in Christ. All the glory of God, the Son of God who became man, everything of God is in him. This great God, this universal God has become particular. This great God of everything in general has become very specific. The God of everyone, everywhere, for all time became this man at that place, at that time. God became man. And this is why John wrote the 21 chapters that we have in his gospel. And there were many, many things he could have written, as he says here. And in the end of his book, the very last verse, he tells us that if he'd written everything about Jesus, there wouldn't be enough room on planet Earth to contain all the books because there are so many extraordinary things to write. He selected just a very few for this gospel. He's picked out just a few 
of the miracles and just a few of the discussions that Jesus had that he remembers because he was there for some of them, if not all of them. And he said, the point is this, not to satisfy your curiosity, not to give you a good bedtime read, but so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. By believing, you may have life in his name. I suppose there are three steps here in what he's looking for from us in his book that he wrote. Credence, the first one. Belief that. Do you believe that these things are true? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that God became man in Jesus Christ? He wants us to know that. It's essential that we know this. It's central, as I've tried to show you, to our whole relationship with God and our whole understanding of the world and our place in it. Is he the Son of God or not? John says, yes, and I want to show you so that you may know and believe it. See, Christianity has always been what you might call a a doctrinal religion. It's always been important in Christianity what you believe, and particularly what you believe about Jesus Christ. It's always been central to our religion. And it might be interesting to, to know that that's not true of other religions particularly. Other religions don't work in that way. Islam, for example, from what I understand of it, the five pillars of Islam, the five fundamentals, are all things that you do. So you fast for Ramadan. You pray five times a day. You go to Mecca on pilgrimage. That's the Muslim faith. Orthopraxy, doing the right things. Christianity has its heart the question of orthodoxy. Do you believe the right things? And so John says, I want you to believe the right things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to believe... That he is the Christ, the Son of God. There's more than that, though, isn't there? There's more than that. As John shows us in different ways in his book, there's also the question of confidence. Personal confidence in. Credence, confidence, belief in the Lord Jesus. A personal trust and loyalty to him, a commitment to him, to follow him. I want you to imagine that you live in one of those countries that we prayed for a moment ago. Afghanistan, say. And you need to get out. If the government find you, if the forces of law and order find you, they'll kill you. So you've got to escape. But how are you going to do it? You can't go to the airport and get a plane. You'll be arrested straight away. You might try and drive your car over the border, but you'll probably be stopped at a checkpoint. If they've got a photo of you or a number plate or something... Then they'll arrest you there and then. How are you going to leave this country safely? You're going to have to walk out through the mountains. But how is that possible? What is the route out? What is the path through? You need a guide. You need a guide. Can you trust this guide? I mean, it's possible that he might betray you to the government for a reward. Or he might just kill you and take everything you've got. How do you know you can trust this person? Find out as much as you can about him. John wants us to find out about the Lord Jesus Christ. But then you still got to weigh it up in your mind and say, can I trust this guide to lead me through? Can I put my confidence in him? This is where John wants to bring us to with regards to the Lord Jesus Christ. Can we trust him? Credence, confidence, and then continuance. Thirdly, go on believing. Go on believing. Keep believing until the end. Don't lose your faith. This is also why John wrote. One writer went so far as to say that he doesn't think John's gospel is good for people who are not Christians. If you're not yet a Christian, he said, don't read John's gospel. It's too complicated. It's too deep for you. You won't understand it. I don't agree with that. I know that God has spoken through this book to lead people to Christ. I remember reading it myself before I was a Christian, finding it moving. It drew me to Jesus. But there is truth in what he says. If you're a Christian, John has designed his book to confirm your faith and strengthen it and build you up. And you need that. Your Christian life has been one of ups and downs, of challenges, frustrations, setbacks, disappointments, difficulties, pain. And it will be till the end. You must not give up on Jesus Christ. You must not turn away from him. You must not walk away in despair 
or contempt. You must go on believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, so that you may have life in his name. Think again of the guide through the mountains. It's going to be difficult. You're walking out of Afghanistan on foot. You're going to come to some rough places. You're going to start wondering, is this guy taking me the right way? It's going to, you're going to start thinking, it's too hard for me, I can't go on. You might even start questioning the guide and challenging him. Are you doing this right? Do you know what you're doing? But if you stop trusting the guide, if you sit down in the middle of the path and say, I can't go on anymore, or if you say, right, you go away, I'm going to find my own way now, then you're certainly finished. John wants to confirm you in your faith. This is why he wrote this book, so that you will continue to believe and have life in Jesus' name. I mentioned before that John is very selective in what he includes in this book. Just a few of Jesus' miracles. And he calls them signs. All of the miracles that we read about in John's Gospel are amazing things, extraordinary things. But the idea, John says, is this. You don't just stop and say, wow, that was an amazing thing. You say, that was an amazing person. You may believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God. So think about the first miracle that Jesus worked. It was a wedding, Cana in Galilee. And at a certain point in the festivities, they ran out of wine. And it just so happened that there were six stone water jars there, quite large. And the Lord Jesus said to the servants, well, fill them up with water then. That's what they did. And then he said, draw some. And they drew out, but what they did, water, it was wine. And the host tasted the wine, and he said, this is good. Why have you kept this good stuff until now? This is better than the other stuff we've been drinking. An amazing thing happened. But look at John chapter 2, verse 11 with me. Turn that up, if you will. John chapter 2, verse 11. We're told this is the first of the signs that Jesus did. He did it at Cana in Galilee. And in this way, he displayed his glory. This showed that he's God. All the glory of God is in him. That great, infinite God. A God of everything, everyone, everywhere. All time and space. That was the glory that his disciples saw that day. The glory of that God in Jesus. And they believed in him. And John says, I've written this down so that you can read it 2,000 years later and you can believe in him as well. I saw it, John says. I was there. I know you weren't there, but I'm telling you about it in my book so that you also can believe in Jesus and know that he's the Son of God and trust him. Some books put the conclusion at the end. So you read the book and then you get the summary. John puts his conclusion at the beginning in chapter 1. And so we'll turn back a page or two to the first few verses of John's Gospel where he sums up everything he learnt about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll just point out to you verse 14 of John chapter 1. This is John looking back on everything he saw and heard in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says this, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Yes, Jesus truly was flesh and blood. He truly was a man made of the same stuff as we are. Nothing false about it, nothing spooky. He wasn't some kind of spirit or ghost. He actually was one of us, and he lived among us. But John says, we've seen his glory. Looking back over everything he saw and heard during Jesus' ministry, all the things he put in his book, all the things he didn't put in his book, we've seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father. No other. Full of grace and truth. Full of reality. Full of kindness. Full of the ultimate reality of God. Full of the undeserved love and kindness of God. The glory of God in a man. 
That's what John wants us to know as we read his gospel. To discover or rediscover the truth about Jesus Christ and to trust him or to continue trusting him and to have life in his name. Now with all that in mind, we turn to the resurrection in John chapter 20. And we just look now at the first ten verses, the empty tomb. And we remember why this is here. Why are we reading this about the empty tomb? What's the point of it all? That we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. By believing, we may have life in his name. I'll read it to you again. John 20, verse 1 to 10. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they've laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him, went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there. And the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Remember, as I say, why this is here? To strengthen your faith, Christian friend. Jesus is the Christ, truly the Son of God. Strengthen your conviction for the months and years ahead, whatever you have to go through. And for those of you who are not Christians, that you may know and believe and have life in his name. This incident, I think, points us to the glory of Jesus. This is the first day of the week then, Sunday. And on the Friday evening, after the death of Jesus, they took his body down from the cross... And by rights, this body should have been thrown out onto the ash heap, burnt. Because he was killed as a criminal. But he had a couple of influential followers who spoke up for him at that point. Although dead, they wanted to honor him. So Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy man, and Nicodemus, one of the ruling council, took charge of the body with the permission of Pontius Pilate. Joseph, it happened, had a tomb with no bodies in it. Nobody had used it. This is a a small cave cut into the side of a a cliff or a hill. And evidently there's a large stone that can seal off the entrance. So this is where they're going to place the body of Jesus. Nicodemus provides the embalming materials to wrap up the body so that it doesn't decay. This is a bit like uh, Egyptian mummies, as I understand You wind the body up in strips of linen. But this linen first is soaked in sticky spices. Myrrh and aloes are mentioned in John 19. You soak the strips of linen in this very sticky resinous stuff and then wind it around the body. And it says that Nicodemus brought about 75 pounds in weight of these uh, spices. So that's about the weight of a small child. A lot of stuff. And they're soaking the strips and winding them around the body. And then they put the body in the tomb, seal the entrance with the stone. The next day is Saturday, the Sabbath, so nobody does anything. But as soon as the Sabbath is over, in our passage, people come at the break of dawn to the tomb. Mary Magdalene is mentioned. Other Gospels tell us that there were other women with her. And the first thing they see is the stone has gone from the tomb. Mary assumes that... Someone has moved it and, for some reason, taken the body of Christ out. They've taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they've laid him. She sticks around in the garden and, a little later on, meets Jesus Christ herself. But meanwhile, Peter and the other disciple run towards the tomb. This other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, we're told, This is none other than John, the writer of our book, who is writing these things for us. He is writing what he saw on that first Easter day. They ran, and these two men, they're different. One of them 
can run faster than the other. They're different physically. So John, the other disciple, reaches the tomb first, verse 4. He bends down to look in through the low entrance, and you can see these cloths, these cloths that were soaked in myrrh and aloes, lying there, these linen strips. There's no body there. He doesn't go in, but these two men are different physically. They're different temperamentally as well. So Peter goes straight into the tomb. That's the kind of man he was. Different kind of personality. And he saw the linen cloths, and he saw the face cloth in a separate place, folded up. And then the other disciple, John, goes in, and he sees the same thing, and he believed. It's clinched it for him. At that point, he became, in the fullest sense of the word, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's still things he didn't understand because it goes on to say he didn't understand the scriptures that Christ must rise from the dead. But he believed. What did he believe? Well, first and foremost, most obviously, he believed the tomb was empty. The body had gone. Anybody could see that. There was no one there. The corpse had disappeared. But then secondly... Unlike Mary, he believed the body had not been stolen. Imagine for some reason, and I don't know why anybody would have wanted to do this, but imagine for some reason somebody rolled back the stone, went in and removed the corpse of Jesus Christ. Are they really going to sit there and unwind all these linen cloths first and leave them neatly folded up? Seems unlikely. John thought so anyway. John realized when he saw those linen cloths, nobody stole the body. Nobody moved the body. There wasn't a human hand that removed the corpse of Christ from that place. So he believes the only other explanation, Jesus is restored to life. Perhaps he should have believed that a bit earlier because Christ had talked about it often enough and spoken about it plainly. But every time he spoke about rising from the dead, they didn't understand what he meant. They thought it was some kind of parable or something. They couldn't work it out. Now, seeing these linen strips, seeing the body gone, he believes. Christ is risen. And there's more to it than that. Think about these wrappings again. How are they still there? And the body gone? What has happened? I suppose it's possible, is it? You can imagine such a thing that the Lord Jesus woke up from death, sat up and began unwinding all these strips, did he? I suppose it's possible. But I think it's more likely, and other writers have said this, so I'm not the first one to come up with it, I think it's more likely that he just disappeared from inside of them and left them there like a kind of empty shell, a chrysalis. I also think it's likely, and other people have said this too, that he just disappeared from inside the tomb, reappeared on the outside. It's been said many times, the stone was rolled away, not so much to let the Lord Jesus out, but to let the disciples in so they could see what had happened. And certainly we know later on in the chapter that he is quite capable of appearing inside a locked room The locks on the doors and the bars on the windows were no barrier to him. So I think it's quite likely that what the disciples saw when they saw these linen cloths is a kind of empty shell of of strips of linen wound still in the shape of the Lord Jesus and he's gone from inside it. So you have the cloths around the body and then separately the separate cloths around the head still lying there and he has disappeared from within it. Powerful evidence that... He's risen. And that this new resurrection body, by the way, is a different kind of body from what he had before. Remember we talked about this in 1 Corinthians, those of you who've been here over the weeks. 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection body, very different from these bodies we have now. But of course Christ has risen and he has this new, glorious, immortal body. This uh, body that is fit for life in glory with God. This imperishable body. All those contrasts in 1 Corinthians 15 that we went through. And I think there's even more here than that. 
amazing as all that sounds. I think this speaks to the fact that the Lord Jesus raised himself from the dead. Now, it does say, yes, again and again in the Gospels and in the Acts and in the Epistles, God raised him. But we must not assume he was passive in this. I want to contrast this with the raising of Lazarus. Do you know the account of Lazarus' resurrection in John 11? Just turn back to chapter 11, verse 38 to 44. Lazarus, the friend of Jesus, has been dead for four days. And the Lord Jesus has come. If he'd come earlier, he could have healed him when he was ill. But he came later, after he'd been in the tomb for four days. John 11, verse 38, exactly the same as we saw with the body of Jesus. There's a tomb with a cave and a stone laying against it. And the Lord Jesus says, take away the stone. And they protest, verse 39 of John 11, this is not going to be good. You don't want to do that. This is not going to smell nice. Did I not tell you, if you believed, you would see, that phrase again, the glory of God? So they took away the stone. The Lord Jesus prayed. Then verse 43, he called Lazarus out of the tomb. So did God call the Lord Jesus out of the tomb in this way? Was Jesus passive in this miracle? Lazarus was passive. Lazarus was dead. If it wasn't for the Lord Jesus, he'd have stayed there. Christ summoned him back to life and he came out. But look at this difference. The man who died came out, verse 44, still with these cloths wrapped around him. He's got no power himself to come back to life. He's got no power himself to get out from these cloths, sticky as they were with these spices. He has to be unwound, untie him, unbind him, the Lord Jesus says, and let him go. It's a very different scenario. Here a man has been raised from the dead, by the power of God in the Lord Jesus. The evidence of the tomb that John and Peter saw is that the Lord Jesus raised himself. Nobody needed to call him out. Nobody needed to unwind the strips off him. He dealt with it all himself by his own divine authority. This indeed is only what he said himself. Speaking to the disciples on an earlier occasion, he said, I have power... For this reason, the Father loves me, he says, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. Jesus said, I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. John 10, 17, 18. And this resurrection then, this raising himself from the dead, this is the greatest of all the signs that Jesus ever performed. Of all those miracles the ones we read about in the Gospels, and many, many others that nobody ever wrote down. This is the greatest. This is the one, above all, that should convince you that he is indeed the Son of God and that you want to trust him and follow him. He raised himself from death. He came back to life. Nobody brought him back. He, the Son, with the authority and power of the Father, came back to life by himself. He overcame death and entered into resurrection life. He said this himself. He said this would be his greatest sign. When people challenged him, when people asked him where his authority came from, and they said to him, what sign do you do to show that you've come from God? Can you demonstrate to us your authority? And he said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Remember his story? Remember what happened with him? Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So you want to know whether I'm for real? He says to them, You want to know whether I am the Christ? Do you want to know whether I'm just another man, a troublemaker? Do you want to know whether God is in me? 
Watch and see. Three days in the tomb and then raised. Watch that sign and see if it's true or not. See if I am who I say I am. Again, and perhaps we'll look this one up. John chapter 13. No, John chapter 2, I beg your pardon, verse 13. Almost at the start of Jesus' ministry, as John gives it to us. In Jerusalem. Again, the same question. Who are you? What authority do you have? In this occasion, John 2, verse 13 to 22, the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Same question. What are the signs that Jesus has the authority of God? What are the signs that he's God the Son who became a man? What are the signs that he is the one, that all of the glory of the great God is in him? What are the signs that you should trust him and follow him for the rest of your life? This is what he said. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. They thought he meant the building they were in. They thought he meant that great temple building, and they said, it's taken us 46 years to build this temple. Will you raise it up in three days? But the temple he was speaking about was a temple of his body. Destroy this temple, he was saying. And I will raise it up in three days. I will come back to life. I will resurrect myself to glorious new life. The tomb will be empty with the cloths lying there. So you will know and be sure that I am indeed the Christ, the Son of God. And when therefore he's raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this. And they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the great sign then. The great pointer to Jesus Christ. The great evidence that God truly was and is in him. All of the glory of God in a man. Some of you are at the point where you've not yet accepted this. You still like to think of this general God with all these different things and different ways of relating to him. Nobody really knows because he's too big. He's too vast. Well, I want to encourage you to come to that point of credence. Belief that this is God's son. The evidence is here. This book is written to persuade you. Remember what John said? I wrote so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This book is for you. This book is for you. I don't know whether Jesus is that special. They go on about Jesus a lot. I don't know whether it's true that there's a heaven and a hell. I don't know whether he died for our sins. It's all here. This book is for you. Some of you believe and you say, yeah, we're talking about stuff I already know. I already believe all that. You and I need to continue. We need to continue. We need continuance. Life in Jesus' name is promised to us. Resurrection life. Life beyond death. Life beyond this world. Life beyond all the frustrations and pains and limitations and sadnesses and injustices of this world. Life with that great God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But we need to continue. Reinforce your faith. Strengthen your conviction. Read John's Gospel again. Who is this Jesus? Who else could he be? Of course the glory of God's in him. Of course we must trust him. Of course we must follow him. Of course we can trust him. Read and be persuaded again. Be renewed in your faith. Who else would we go to? Think of that guide again through the mountain passes out of the dangerous country and into a new life. Who else would you go to? Who else would lead you through? Who else can lead you through this life into the world beyond? Who else 
can show you the path of life, the narrow way? Who else can walk with you all the way? Who else can guarantee that there is peace and forgiveness with God for all your sins and shortcomings? Who else can promise you that you'll arrive safely in the glory of God when your days here are done? Renew your confidence in Jesus Christ, my friend. Who else will you go to? If you turn away from him, who else will you go to? For some of you, I think, at this point, where you need to put your confidence in him. You know it's true. You're not arguing with it. You know he is who he said he is. You know that he is the way, the truth, and the life. You know there's no other. You know he is the light of the world. You know he is the bread of life. He said, he who believes in me will never be thirsty. He who comes to me will never be hungry. But you've not yet trusted him yourself. You've not yet said, I believe in you. You've not yet said, as Thomas said, after Jesus rose from the dead, my Lord and my God. Jesus said, you believe because you've seen. Blessed are those who have not seen and who yet believe. And you've not come to that point. It must not be a good moment this Easter Sunday to turn and trust the Lord Jesus Christ with your life. Rely on him. All that you need is here. John wrote this book for you. He wrote it that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Not just in an abstract level, not just in a way of knowing that it's true somehow, but actually committing yourself to him so that you may have life in his name. I pray that you will do that today. Let's pray.